Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I guess we could get get started tonight. Um, uh, there's always the, the um, obligatory remarks. If you could please turn off your beepers and cell phones for the duration of the talk, it'd be greatly appreciated. Um, and welcome all. Uh, this is a series. This is a lecture in the series called Technology, Cogni Cognition, and Culture. Um, the series attempts to uh, explore and trace the evolution of information technology. Uh, and the influence it has had on civilization. Uh, the lecture series is sponsored by the Computer and Information Technology Institute, the Center for the Study of Cultures, and the University Libraries at Rice. Um, <clears throat> it's a distinct pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Doug Greenberg tonight. Doug is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Survivors of the Shoah um, Visual History Foundation and he will talk a bit about what the foundation is doing and, and its mission and, and purpose uh, in his talk tonight. Doug came to the foundation from uh, the Chicago Historical Society where he was president uh, and director for seven years. Prior to that, he served as the vice president of the American Council of Learned Societies and before that was the associate dean of the faculty at Princeton University. Uh, Doug has been a friend of mine and a colleague uh, for over a decade, and I am continually moved by his capacity not only to teach but to learn, uh, and also uh, so deeply impressed by the rigor and passion that he brings to his subjects. So tonight, Doug will be speaking on the topic, Henry's Harmonica, Memory and History in a Genocidal World. Please welcome Doug Greenberg. Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I should say that I'm going to talk only a little bit about technology uh, and a little bit more about cognition, but mostly uh, about culture. Uh, although I can't claim to know a lot, a lot about any of them, I have some ideas about how they interact that I want to talk about uh, tonight. I also want to say a couple other things by way of full disclosure. One of them, uh, which you may recognize from Chuck's introduction and from the, the uh, various uh, pieces of publicity that have been sent around about this talk, is that I am not an expert on the Holocaust. Uh, I am, in fact, uh, by training, a historian of 17th and 18th century American law, if you can imagine such a person being the president of the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. There's another lecture that explains how I got from point A to point B. But what I'm about to, to, to say tonight will, will sound, I fear, as though I think I am an expert uh, on the Holocaust, and I'm not. Uh, I've only been in my current job for four and a half years. Uh, I've spent most of that time, in addition to making sure that the electricity and the heat and the air conditioning work at the Shoah Foundation and begging for money, uh, I've spent a lot of that time reading as much as I could in the secondary literature about the Holocaust and, of course, watching the testimony of survivors and other eyewitnesses. So you might think of, of what I'm going to do tonight as a sort of interim report on what I think I might have learned uh, over the last four and a half years and what I think it means. Uh, before I get into the talk, though, I, I do want to say thank you to, to Chuck and to everyone who's welcomed me so warmly, uh, both at Rice and, and in, in Houston in the last 24 hours. Uh, it really is a special privilege for me to be at Rice. Rice has been a, an important partner for the Shoah Foundation. Those of you who are associated with Rice know that, in fact, you can search the Shoah Foundation archive um, on Rice computers with a direct connection to our uh, technology in Los Angeles. Rice is of one of only originally of three universities in the country, the others being USC and Yale, 
where this is possible. There's now a fourth, uh, the University of Michigan. And Rice has been an extremely important partner to us. And I want to especially acknowledge Chuck Henry's contribution to that. It's made a big difference. We've learned a lot, both about our technology. Well, I could say we've learned a lot about technology, cognition, and culture uh, as a consequence of our uh, partnership with Rice. And uh, so I'm, it, it really is a special privilege for me to be here to the talk. We live in a genocidal world. The term genocide is modern coined by an American refugee from Poland named Rafael Lemkin in 1944 to describe the undescribable, the indescribable. Lemkin lost all of his family in the Holocaust, and he spent the entire rest of his life campaigning to get the United Nations to adopt and the United States to ratify the International Genocide Convention. He succeeded in the former, and he did not live to see the latter. He coined the word genocide. That word is one he coined whose meaning all of us now recognize. I'm sure there's nobody in this room who doesn't understand what the word genocide means. But it's actually a very new word. It's a linguistic artifact of the 20th century. But the barbarity that it describes is ancient, as old as all of human history. Each of us, however unschooled in history we may be, know this instinctively. We human beings have been remarkably good at killing each other in almost inconceivable numbers, and we are getting tragically better at it all the time. In fact, both the pace and the scale of genocide have increased drastically rather than decreased since Lemkin coined the word and campaigned to rally the international community against mass murder. All in all, it's a discouraging story to contemplate I don't intend this evening to speculate about human nature or to try and explain why we repeatedly find justifications for murdering vast numbers of people who differ from us by reason of race or religion or language or culture or whatever other absurd or meaningless distinction of the moment we might use to justify mass slaughter. That sort of fundamentally existential inquiry, to my mind, is a futile task for an historian. And although I've spent most of my life recent life as an administrator, I still think of myself as a historian. I think that kind of inquiry is best left to the philosophers and the theologians, or perhaps these days to the evolutionary biologists. Explaining genocide and mass murder as a nearly universal human phenomena they are is simply not a task to which an historian's tools are really very well suited. Although historians are reasonably good, I think, at understanding and describing the parameters of particular human experience, we are not usually very good at explaining or trying to answer in a general way the big questions of human existence. And we are especially inept at understanding evil. And explaining the endless river of bloody violence and sickening exploitation that flows like a torrent through the human past is simply beyond the range of our abilities and disciplinary training. And of course, genocide, the attempted murder of entire civilizations, is only part of it. The world in which we live and in which our ancestors lived is not only genocidal. It has also turned organized, governmentally sponsored violence into its most perfectly realized and most universal accomplishment, one of the very few things that almost every government does well. Historians can describe, but they cannot explain, this appalling consistency. Today, in the midst of another war, three years removed from the events of 9-11, and while mass murder proceeds unabated in Darfur, we would do well to remember that it is unfortunately the case that such arenas of death have polluted all of human history. The close proximity of mass death in time and space may be new to many people sitting in this room, but it is not unique either in human history or in the history of the United States. We Americans should also remember that as awful, as agonizing as the events of September 11, 2001 were, almost five times as many of our countrymen died in a single day at the Battle of Antietam as died in the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon. Now, many of you will understandably say to me after that, ah, you shifted away. You're not talking about genocide anymore. War and genocide are not the same thing. Those men, those Americans at Antietam were soldiers. Their deaths shouldn't be compared with the deaths of our beloved and innocent fellow citizens 
who did nothing more than go to their jobs on September 11th. And I will say to you in response, tell that to the mothers of the Union and Confederate war dead at Antietam. Their pain and their loss knew no distinction between civilian and soldier, between Americans and others. And, the pain, and that pain and that loss are really at the center of the subject that I'm going to try to address. Or you may say, yes, 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 I understand. You're right. I understand this agony that you're describing. You'll say, I know that you're right, because the group from which I come has also been victimized. You will say, I am a Jew, and my family were slaughtered by the Nazis. Or you will say, I am an African American, and members of my family I never knew died horrible deaths in the Middle Passage and suffered grievously in the slave South. Or perhaps you will say, I am an American Indian, and my people have been under continuous threat of extinction from Europeans and their descendants for 500 years. Or you may say, I am an Ab Australian Aborigine, the victim of a self-conscious and systematic attempt by white Australians to obliterate me and my culture. Or you may remind me that you're a Palestinian, a child of survivors of the massacres at Shatila. Or perhaps you'll say, I am Chinese, and the Japanese brutalized my family and killed almost 400,000 of my countrymen in the space of less than four months in the rape of Nanjing. And I would say to each of you, no matter what your personal story is, no matter what your background is, that we are all part of a tradition of perpetrating this sort of murder, as well as traditions of victimhood. If you're a Jew, I will send you to meet the parents of Palestinian children killed by Israeli rockets and mortars. If you're a Palestinian, I will send you to the parents of children blown up by suicide bombers on buses as they went off to school. If you're an Afri African American, I will ask you to talk with the descendants of American Indians whose families were wiped out by the Buffalo soldiers of the black regiments. And if you're an American Indian, I will send you to meet African American friends who are part Cherokee because their great-great-grandmothers were slaves on Cherokee farms. If you're Chinese, I will send you to Tibet to meet the victims of China's invasion and long oppression of that sad country. We live in a violent and a murderous world, and it is a world in which we are all implicated. The pain it inflicts on those who survive its atrocities know no limit of race or of culture, no boundary of nation or of creed, this lingering ad agony, the agony of irretrievable loss, is the most democratically distributed human attribute of all. We live in a genocidal world, and we re rely upon history and historians to describe, explain, and interpret that world. And we also count upon historians to make distinctions, to tell us that soldiers are not the same as civilians, and their deaths, however tragic, do not signify the same thing. We count upon historians to tell us that the barbarity of chattel slavery in the Americas and the slaughter of the Holocaust were different than the intention of one was to exploit human labor and the purpose of the other, to destroy human life. We count upon historians to make even finer distinctions than that and to remind us that the slavery justified by Las Siete Partidas in the Spanish colonies was different than the slavery justified first by English and then by American common and constitutional law. Historians, my kids used to tell me, know lots of stuff. So they will also remind us that slavery under a sugar regime was different than slavery in a cotton or a rice regime, and that the policies of the Nazis were different before late in 1941 than they were after. That the slaughter of the Hungarian Jews in the gas chambers of Auschwitz at the war's end was significantly different than the earlier murder by shooting of Ukrainian Jews in the lime pits of Babi Yar, or the slaughter of Cambodians in Pol Pot's killing fields, or the machete deaths of Tutsis in Rwanda. We are fortunate to have historians to remind us of these things. And I do not say this sarcastically or to disparage the humane and important work of historical scholarship. It is in that tradition that I've spent my entire professional life and I really do regard it as a second kind of religious faith. It is a tradition of rationality and a fidelity to truth as best we can discern it. It is honorable and it is also often courageous. But after almost five years of doing what I do now, I must confess that my faith has been shaken. And I want to suggest to you that history will take us only so far if we want to even begin to understand the profound human meaning of genocide. 
So let me start with some history and the results of some fairly commonplace historians' efforts to describe some episodes of mass death and genocide in our world. For it is, as I've said, a genocidal world. Eventually, however, I'm going to turn to the memory and to the face and to the voice of one man, a man with very little formal education, not a historian, whose experience simultaneously suggests both the importance and ultimately the inadequacy of historical scholarship for understanding our genocidal world. So here is some information, let's call it that, drawn from easily available sources about genocidal violence. These are just some especially striking examples of what historians can offer us by way of concrete and horrifying evidence of humanity's capacity to behave inhumanly. I apologize in advance for what may seem to you a rather clinical, if also sadly familiar, rendering of some terrible facts. First example, the best recent estimate of the population of the Valley of Mexico when Cortez arrived in 1517 is 25 million people. Within 50 years of the conquest, only about one million natives were still alive. Most were killed by disease, especially smallpox, and the Spanish attempted, not always with success, to wipe out the cultures and civilizations that had thrived in Central America. The principal vehicles of this attack on Amerindian civilization were the throne of Spain and the Catholic Church. Second example. Between 1492 and the end of the slave trade, about 400 years later, the best scholarship informs us that as many as 12 million people arrived in the Americas from Africa in the holds of slave ships. The forced migration of Africans to the Americas was one of the most sustained acts of brutality in human history. And that figure of 12 million, of course, only refers to those who survived the trip, a trip during which approximately one half to two thirds of the cargo of slave ships died from starvation, thirst, or disease. So a conservative estimate of the total number of Africans kidnapped in the Atlantic slave trade is probably close to 25 million human beings. Of that number, perhaps 3 million left from a single port in Africa, a place that is now called Dakar, Senegal. And in the harbor of Dakar, there is an island, Gore Island, which is the closest point on the continent of Africa to the Americas. And on that island, there is a building with two doorways. One doorway faces east to the island itself and toward the continent. The other faces the open sea. And there is nothing between that doorway and the Americas but the Atlantic Ocean. And through that one doorway, three million people walked, or more likely were dragged in chains into slavery. Some of those people threw themselves and their children into the sea rather than be enslaved. Some of them died horribly in the fetid holds of slave ships before reaching this hemisphere. Others wound up dying in the sugar plantations of the West Indies and Brazil. And only a tiny, tiny fraction of them, only about 3% of the total, the lucky ones, survived to become slaves in British North America. Other examples. In the 20th century, governments have adopted mass murder as an instrument of policy. 80% of the Herero people of Southwest Africa were slaughtered by the German colonists in 1904. In Turkey, while the United States turned the other way in full knowledge of what was going on, over a million Armenians were killed as a matter of government policy between 1915 and 1917. And in crafting his own genocidal plans, Hitler was later to note the ease with which the so-called Young Turks escaped not only punishment, but international notice and condemnation. Planning the murder of every Jew in the world in 1939, Hitler reminded less ambitious men, who now remembers the Armenians? In the mid-1970s, uncounted millions of Cambodians were murdered by the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot. Tens of thousands of people in the Balkans have been the victims of the latest euphemism for mass murder, ethnic cleansing. And in Rwanda, in 1994, nearly a million Tutsi were slaughtered by their Hutu countrymen in the space of 100 days, most of them in the first three weeks. And while a million Rwandans were being murdered in full view of the entire world, the Clinton administration twiddled its thumbs and its Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, engaged in the pathetic sophistry of trying to distinguish between genocide and what he called genocidal acts. I have no idea what that meant. 
Simultaneously, some of the other Western democracies, most notably France, aided the Hutu militias in their attempt to kill every Tutsi in the country. And today, while Americans comfortably chat about what to buy or sell next, and while our country and every other country in the world turns a mostly blind eye, at least 300,000 people in Darfur and Western Sudan have been murdered, and another 1.5 to 2 million are either starving or homeless. Should we ignore Stalin in this catalog of horrors? Stalin, who killed as many as 5 million people in the Ukraine alone? Perhaps we also ought to note that Saddam Hussein murdered 100,000 Kurds with chemical weapons, while the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration insisted on ignoring the facts and did nothing in the hope of holding on to a profitable food for oil trading relationship. And of course, the barbarities of the other European powers in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and in an earlier period should not go unnoticed either. The most egregious case, in my estimation, was yet enslavement of the entire population of the Belgian Congo to King Leopold at the end of the 19th century. A reign of terror so monstrous that it left 10 million people murdered in the space of 20 years or so and prompted one of the first international human rights protest movements. And even these figures, awful as they are, do not begin to capture the scale of what we are talking about. One estimate quoted by the Aegis Trust, a British foundation that studies such things, places the number of people murdered by direct government action in the 20th century at 170 million. Another way of using the same data suggests that one in 23 of all of the people who lived in the 20th century was killed by a government. And one of six of all the people who lived in the 20th century had a close relative killed by a government into this gruesome abattoir that we have the hubris to call a civilization, into this world of completely incomprehensible statistics of death, of so many millions murdered that the numbers actually lose all of their meaning, step survivors of the Show of Visual History Foundation in 1994 and 1995. While making Schindler's List in Krakow, Poland, Steven Spielberg met many survivors of the Holocaust who reminded him that although Schindler's story was interesting, they too had stories to tell. Inspired by their desire to bear witness for all time to the events of the Shoah, he began Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. And its goal was not the usual scholar's goal of documenting, of describing, of counting, of interpreting. His objective was at once more simple and more complex, to record and to preserve on video the memories of 50,000 survivors and other eyewitnesses to the Holocaust. The idea was to record the still painfully vivid memories of people who had survived, whether they were Jews or gypsies or Jehovah's Witnesses or political prisoners, whether homosexuals or rescuers or liberators. Each witness who was willing to, to give a, a testimony was given the opportunity to tell his or her story. And they are all, every one of them, miraculous, astonishing stories. Everyone associated with the Shoah Foundation understood that if, the, if those stories were not recorded soon, they would never be recorded at all. Many of the survivors were old. They wouldn't be around much longer. Their testimonies have opened a new window on the Holocaust <clears throat> and offered all of us, historians and others as well, a new way to at least try to understand what a number like six million meant in the lived experience of ordinary people. No one in this room, after all, I don't think, has ever seen six million of anything, never mind six million bodies. Today, about 10 years after that effort began, the Shoah Foundation has collected 52,000 testimonies, averaging about two and a half hours in length, in 56 countries and in 32 languages. This amounts to about 120,000 hours of video. All of it will be searchable within the year. If you could bear it, it would take you 13 years, more than 13 years, 24 by 7, to watch the entire archive. But here I am quoting more incomprehensible numbers. The wonder of the Shoah Foundation archive is not in its size or in its breadth, which are impressive by themselves. It is rather contained in the searing memories, meticulously recorded one by one, of the people who shared their stories with us. Although, as I've indicated, the painstaking statistics of the historians have a claim on the past that we must respect, the memories of the survivors have claims too. Claims that cannot be documented by statistics, 
but must be acknowledged in the minute details of the stories they tell about their own lives and the lives and deaths of those who did not survive. So unless you have 13 years to spare, I can't show you all of these amazing stories. Collecting them was a challenge in itself, but an even greater challenge was to devise a way to use the testimonies of survivors effectively to support research and education. Our solution has been a unique, we think it's unique, digital library system, a system available here at Rice, as well as at three other universities, and eventually, we hope, at 200 universities around the world. Briefly, what that system does is to associate terms in a hierarchically arranged keyword thesaurus with time codes in the video. The real result is a system that permits a user both to search for whole testimonies, for example, women from Bialystok who survived Auschwitz, and also to search for segments of testimony on, on particular subjects. Women from Bialystok who survived Auschwitz describing their arrival at Auschwitz, for example. Of course, it isn't the system that associates these keywords with the video. Real people do that. People who do nothing all day but watch testimony. And using a software application we've developed, build a searchable database keyword by keyword, segment by segment of video. Those are the real heroes of the work of the Shoah Foundation, apart from the survivors and witnesses themselves. This enormously complex task, and it is enormously complex as, as Chuck knows, will be done in all 32 languages less than a year from now. And although we have a grant actually from the National Science Foundation to investigate how to automate that process, when it is complete, it will be complete only because of a remarkable under effort undertaken by an extraordinary people who have been laboring at it for the last eight years. I should add that we think the system has broad application beyond the testimonies in our archive. It is patented, and we think of it, as it were, as version 1.0 of a set of applications for searching, using, and eventually citing digital video that will have long-term significance for disciplines in every branch of learning. And, and Rice is a good example. Uh, professors uh, in a range of disciplines at Rice are using these testimonies, not only uh, people in history. In that sense, what we've tried to do in our work is marry computer science and engineering and technology on the one side to history and humanity and the humanities on the other. Well, let me return for a minute to this question of history and memory and how they intersect. I want to show you a clip from just one testimony, a very brief clip. Uh, and it's a clip, actually, that if you want to tomorrow, you can pull up yourself on the system here at Rice by searching on, among other keywords, hunger in concentration camps. And I hope it'll give you some idea of the difference between memory and history. The man you're about to meet. Henry Rosemarin was born in a small town, a shtetl in western Poland. At the time of the story he's about to tell you, he was about the age of a high school junior. Henry survived life in six different concentration camps, including Dachau. And like many survivors, he was moved from place to place many times. We're going to pick up his testimony as he describes the beginning of a particularly remarkable night in Carvin a labor camp in what is now the Czech Republic, where on the night he's about to describe, he almost died of starvation and cold. So meet Henry Rosemarin. You can turn on the video now. Then one night, as I was laying, contemplating you know, the next day's ordeal, all of a sudden, somebody shakes me and says, hey, Henry, get up, get up. I said, who? And I recognize a guy from Dierenford camp, from the other camp, from the forced labor camp, where most of us were Jews. And this kid was like 14 or 13 at the time, a young kid. And he became a runner, uh, sort of a, like an orderly to the commandant, to the, to the lager and this, that. And this, in this new, like, a new camp now, in this Dierenford too. He says, the, he wants, Lagerstein wants to see you, the commandant wants to see you. I said, who, me? What, 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 what did I do? He said, no, no, don't worry. He says, you know, he's a harmonica buff. He said, he plays harmonica. He thinks he plays. He said, but he blows that thing, doesn't know a damn thing how to play. He says, I told him about you. And he says, I couldn't find you. I didn't know what barrack you're on, but I remembered you from, from the other place. 
And I said, yeah, but I don't have a harmonica. He says, he has a bunch of harmonicas. He says, come on, he wants to see you. And I said, oh my God. You come on, he wants to see me. This must have been, I don't know what, I had no watch, I had no idea what time it was. It must have been midnight, maybe. So we, I quickly put on my wet pants and my, my jacket and, and shuffled along with his wooden shoes and came to the commandant's quarters and he's nice and warm. He's sitting there drinking uh, whatever, schnapps or whatever, you know. And he, he thought there was no skin. He, he was, his cheeks were red and, and puffy and had a, even have a stomach too, and you could see the guy is eating well and, and, and off of us. And he says, yeah, spiel doch was, and throws a harmonica at me. And I call it, uh, I shouldn't have asked him, was, you know, was soll es sein, Herr was soll es sein, what, what, what should it be, what, what do you wish? And uh, he says, spiel was for Schubert, and I, I didn't play Schubert, I, 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 I don't know Schubert, I remember I, I, it was a serenade uh, and I took that harmonica and silently I was praying to God for, for, for a good performance here because you know, if, I, if I don't do right, who knows what he'll do with me. And I was trying to remember what to play. I should, I should have asked him what to play. I should have picked up a polka or something easy. And, 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 but he, he says, Spiel of was from Schubert, so how am I? You know, go on to tell him, no, let's play something else. You, you, you don't say no to him. So I started to play the, 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 the Schubert Stentier, the serenade. It's, in English, it's known as a serenade. It's a beautiful melody. And you know, when I, when I finished, he started, he started looking around, and he went over there, and I must see something in his hand, something bigger than a harmonica, and he, yeah, and he threw at me, and I was caught it like a like, like a football player today. I used to be a goalie on my soccer team, and I caught it. And it's a loaf of bread, a loaf, a whole loaf of bread. So I, I thanked him, you know, I stood at attention and, and thanked him, and he says, "How up? Get, get out of here!" And um, uh, oh, before I said, he says, uh, "What does he do?" And, he said, and the kid says, "What do you do?" I said, "I'm working so and so." Baustelle, I mean, that's so and so detail, uh, mixing concrete. My, he says, get him a job in the, town, in, in the kitchen. And, and he says, get a hold of a guitar. Anybody plays guitar? And he says, I don't know, I'll find out. Two or three days later, I'm working in the kitchen. I have potatoes, carrots, I'm scrubbing, I'm eating, you know, I have extra soup. In the evening, if this was enough, he got a hold of a guitar player and he had this idea of going to the mess hall for the, for, get where the guards are eating and play something for the mess. So we're playing polkas and waltzes, you know, and a guitar player was a gypsy who was accompanying me. And after that, we had to clean up the tables, which was, which was D, that was the perk. And uh, that was a wonderful perk because I got to take the trays out. I was supposed to take the trays of the uneaten food with leftovers to the dog pond for the, for the German shepherds to eat. But on the way out, I had to press a long corridor and an outside door to back to the fence. And I would keep looked over my shoulder if they were looking. I would, I would bite into that steak, piece of chicken, you know. And I would eat them because if he would catch me eating the food that was meant for a dog, he would kill me. You know, the dog was more important than this 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 little Jewish guy. So that, in in terms of of miracles, now every day was a miracle in in, in, in camp. But in terms of real miracles, this was the only the one single incident that I actually saved my life. Can you still play that piece? Let's see.
watched that clip, I don't know, several dozen times. And every time I watch it, I see something new and it, some additional insight that I don't know how you'd ever get without hearing Henry tell his, his own story. What's the difference between, between what we learn from Henry's story, and this is a tiny, tiny part of his story, never mind what a tiny percentage it is of the 52,000 stories in our archive. What's the difference between what we learn from Henry's story and what we learn from the historians? What Henry sh shares with us in this very short segment, which is, as I say, only a tiny fraction of all of the stories in the archive, is, I think, the real horror, the personal agony of the Shoah and of all genocides, which was in its randomness with respect to who managed to survive and who was murdered. Henry says his story is a miracle, as most survivors will, will tell you, because he believed that he would die that night, and he did not. And yet he also offers us the opportunity to identify with him as he looks us in the eye to describe the terror that must have gripped this young boy, even if we know, finally, that we can never really feel it, never really understand it. No history book, no litany of statistics can do that for us. Only the face and the voice of a man or a woman who experienced it can open the real horror of the Shoah for us. For that horror was not experienced by the collectivities that historians describe. It was experienced person by individual person, each life, each memory distinct and uniquely excruciating. The number of people killed in the Holocaust and the other genocides I've mentioned tonight, of course, is one measure of the pain that they imposed. But each life, each loss is of equal consequence. The Nazis made Lithuania Judenrein free of Jews between July and October of 1941. To do so, they had to kill exactly 137,422 people. We know this because they kept perversely careful records of their accomplishments. What was the name of the last Jew killed in Lithuania? Was his or her life any more or any less significant than the life of the first victim? Would the crime have been any less if the Nazis had killed 137,421 people instead of 137,422? Would it have been any greater if they had killed 137,423. The Talmud tells us that he who saves a single life saves the world entire. But the Talmud, and this is less frequently quoted, also prefaces that statement by acknowledging that it is also true that he who destroys a single life destroys the world entire. Each death in the Holocaust, and there were 11 million deaths in the Holocaust, six million Jews and five million others, was of equal consequence. In each, the Nazis took not a single life, but destroyed the world entire. And yet there were survivors, men and women like my friend Henry Rosemarin, who came from the ashes of war to denounce their oppressors, wherever and whenever they appeared in the human story. How hopeful to watch testimony, how inspiring, how heroic. I wish it were that simple. It isn't. Henry's story on its face is a story of redemption, a story of hope. And that is true of many survivor stories. After all, they did survive. And it is inspiring to hear them recount the heroic way in which they escaped Hitler's attempt to murder them and, despite everything, managed eventually to rebuild their lives. And many survivors went on as Henry Rosemarin did until he died of cancer three years ago, to live long lives. Henry loved his life, but what did his survival cost him? Henry Rosemarin was as kind and as gentle, as fine a person as I've ever known in my life, but he paid a price for his survival in a life of pain he could never extinguish. To most people he met as he went around his, about his business, he must have seemed a cheerful little man, but he told me within minutes of meeting me that his memories were all that he had and that they were of no comfort to him, that they were a source of chronic and enduring pain. 
The stories of the survivors are stories of life and of redemption. But Henry knew that he had been saved by an almost random act, a miracle, as he put it more than once. But he also asked the question, how many other young men were there who could play the harmonica? How many of them survived? And yet, for those of us fortunate enough to live in this country, and especially at this time, Henry's memories remind us that the numbers do not tell and cannot tell the whole story. They give us something that no other generation in history has ever had, the opportunity to see the faces, to hear the voices of historical eyewitnesses even after they were gone, are gone. No one in this room has ever seen or heard Abraham Lincoln. Only a very, very few of us have heard the voices of ex-slaves recorded by the worst progress, uh, pro the WPA <coughs> in the 30s. But because of the work of the Shoah Foundation, 50, 100, I hope 1,000 years from now, Henry Rosemarin's face and Henry Rosemarin's voice and Henry's harmonica will still be there for people to see and to hear and to learn from. And that is the claim on the future that memory, that 52,000 memories must have in a genocidal world. Now, I probably ought to stop there but I'm not going to. For inevitably, we do have to turn back to history and to the numbers again. Relying on memory alone, like relying on history alone, is too easy. The presence of the survivors' faces and voices and the beautiful sound of Henry's harmonica in our lives can also mislead us. As Henry once told me, if you want to understand the Holocaust, you will never understand it by hearing me. The only ones who truly understood it are dead. The victims knew what we survivors can never understand, and their voices will never be heard. History can mislead us, but so can memory. At the Shoah Foundation, we like to brag. We have 52,000 testimonies. But the Holocaust and all genocides, by definition, are not stories of redemption. They are not stories of memory. They are not stories of resurrection. They are stories of brutality, unfeeling murder, and utter hopelessness. We have 52,000 testimonies. Good for us. At a concentration camp of which many people have never heard, Belgians, 600,000 Jews were murdered between March and November of 1942, a number equivalent to all of the American deaths on both sides in the Civil War. There were two survivors of Belgians. What will we ever know of Belgians or the men, women, and children who died there when almost no one lived to tell us? By the end of 1943, long before the wars or war was over, the deaths at Belgians had combined with those at three other death camps, of which many people have never heard, Sobibor, Chelmno, and Treblinka, to total almost two million victims. There were 120 survivors of those four camps. Or think of it another way. The great, great historian of the Holocaust, Christopher Browning, estimates, estimates that between March of 1942 and February of 1943, about a year, the Nazis murdered 3.5 million people. That is more than 10,000 deaths a day, every day, for almost a year. More than three times as many deaths each and every day for a year as the United States suffered on 9-11. That is like shooting all the students and faculty at two universities the size of Rice tomorrow morning and then shooting the same number of people every day for a year. The only analog in modern memory to this is Rwanda, where the pace of slaughter in mid-1994 was about the same. By comparison, on a per capita basis, basis the events of 9-11 would seem to be statistically trivial if we did not also remind ourselves that suffering is suffering, loss is loss, pain is pain, no matter where, no matter who, no matter when. We've all heard a good deal about Auschwitz in the last couple of weeks <clears throat> because of the 60th anniversary of its liberation. About 1.2 million people were murdered at Auschwitz. But the reason we hear so much about Auschwitz is because there are also more survivors of Auschwitz than any of the other death camps. The only reason that there were so many survivors at Auschwitz is that it was the largest death camp and it was still operating 
at the end of the war, as the other death camps were not. And all of these murders, all of the ones I've just described, all of them occurred after, after the Nazis had already murdered two million people in the actions of the Einsatzgruppen and in the police battalions in, a hundred places like, in hundreds of places like Baba Yar, whose names most of us not only don't know, but we'll never know. More numbers. Of six million Jews killed in the Holocaust, 1.5 million were children. There were three million Polish Jews when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939. There were 45,000 at the end of the war. Or take a small country, the Netherlands, a country which has a reasonably good reputation with respect to the Holocaust, not completely deserved. We have 1,000 testimonies of Dutch survivors at the Shoah Foundation. But there were 140,000 Dutch Jews when the Nazis arrived, and there were 5,000 left in 1945. Almost all the victims, including Anne Frank, shuttled through the transit camp at Westerbork, where today, on the assembly ground, there are 102,000 individual bricks to mark each life that passed through the camp's gates on its way to a horrible death in the death camps to the east. There are only 102,000 of these bricks on that assembly ground. But they overwhelm you when you see them. And they represent less than 1% of all the people murdered in the Shoah. Two thirds of all the Jews of Europe were wiped out in the Holocaust. Or reduce it to something even more local. This room, I'm told, holds about 250 people. If all the seats were full, and each person had been a European Jew in 1939, only 70 would have survived until 1945, and perhaps, perhaps, only one would have given testimony to the Shoah Foundation. So when we say at the Shoah Foundation that we have 52,000 testimonies of survivors, we also have to remember what a tiny, tiny number that is compared against the number of victims of the Shoah. And think what else was lost. The vitality and the variety not of Jewish life, but of European life, were permanently extinguished. How many Einsteins, or Freuds, or Chagalls, or Singers, how many doctors, philosophers, theologians, historians, how many tailors, shopkeepers, butchers, shoemakers, were never even born because of the Nazis? How many fathers? How many mothers? How many brothers? How many sisters? How many friends never entered this world? because the Nazis decided to exterminate, that's their word, European Jewry. And good historians will again remind us that this is only one genocide. We live in a genocidal world, a world, in fact, in which genocide is now easier to undertake than it was before the Shoah, and I would be prepared to argue where it is also much more easily tolerated. What are the survivors of Rwanda? of Cambodia, of East Timor, of Darfur? What are the survivors of the Armenian genocide whose faces and voices we will never see and never hear? We live in a world in which neither memories like Henry's nor a history like the one I have recounted can give us very much comfort or hope that the word progress has very much meaning, except in the most literal, material, and technological sense. It is a genocidal world. History and memory both provide too abundant evidence of what the cost, not only to the victims and to, to the survivors, but also to all of us, has been and continues to be. But the cost of genocide also imposes a responsibility on those who survive it, and on all of us here. Henry's voice and Henry's harmonica can still be heard. Hitler did not silence Henry or the other survivors, despite the nearly unbearable pain that he inflicted upon them. They outlived him to tell their stories to the Shoah Foundation and to anyone else who would listen. And we should heed them faithfully, remembering always that history and memory both have something to teach. We must hope that Henry's harmonica may yet echo down the generations to help us to learn to live in and to create a better world, a world where genocide can be neither imagined nor perpetrated. That may seem, given everything else I've said tonight, a vain and almost impossibly naive hope. And yet, when Henry Rosemarin lay in that stinking concentration camp bunk, 
thinking that death was surely upon him, he too might have regarded survival as a futile dream. But he didn't, and neither should we. We could, in other words, do much worse than to learn to dance to the tune of Henry's harmonica. Thank you. Comments. <laughs> Part of what's very unique about this is it's, it's for the first time in history we have the technology to have an archive with 50,000 testimonies, right? I mean, when, when you guys started, it really wasn't there, but technology moves fast enough so now you can have it. But what worries me is that the technology moves ahead and you guys, in some sense, are helping us by developing all this technology. And in 10 years, this will be commonplace. We'll have an archive with 50,000 testimonies of everything. And, you know, it's like these home movies, right? It's so easy to make them, so we're all mm. drowning in home movies. Nobody wants to watch them. Mm. We'll be, are we going to be drowning in archives? Well, historians are always happy to drown in archives. <laughs> um, well, a couple of things. First of all, th there actually is a predecessor to the Shaw Foundation, which I should acknowledge. Uh, Yale University began the Fortunoff Archive in 1979, which began the collection of te survivor testimony on, on video. Uh, and we now work closely with Yale, but there, that, and that's actually there's an interesting set of, of, of projects to do comparing the testimonies in the Yale Archive to the testimonies in our archive, because they're some of the same people at different points in their lives. Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, sure, it, but, but part of what we're anticipating is that the way we record a lot of information about the present is with video. And with digital video now, I mean, 10 years ago when the Shaw Foundation was started, digital video was a very high-end thing that, that almost nobody had. We didn't use digital video at the beginning. We used beta. Um, and now you know, people are recording their children's birthday parties on digital video. Uh, and uh, it's certainly true that 10, 15, 20 years from now, there's going to be an awful lot of digital video out there that's junk. Uh, but but that's, that's, you know, people have always created a lot of junk. Uh, that's only a matter of, of format. The important thing is to be able to have tools to distinguish the junk from the really valuable stuff. Uh, historians have a way of even finding the historical significance of the junk. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't worry about. Uh, about people drowning in too much information. What I worry more about, and, and it is something to worry about, is having the right tools for people to search through the, the, the mass of information available to them so that they can find the material that really has value, both, both intellectual value and moral value. Uh, we were talking about this at, at lunchtime today. I mean, it really is a, a question. You know, that, you all know this, uh, that, and those of you who are students know it too. When you're given an assignment, the first thing you do is you go to Google. Uh, and a lot of what Google will, will give you off of the internet is junk, uh, unreliable junk. Uh, you do much better to look in the catalog of the library. But uh, I do it too. I mean, I mean, we all do it. I mean, we have these tools, so we use them. So I think that's the, the challenge in some ways is a technical challenge, a technological challenge, a computer challenge, more than it is a challenge about what we ought to record. We ought to record everything we can uh, and, and count on people like you to help us find the tools to, to find the good stuff. Yeah. Have you, taken, have you taken and opened the library to Google to have them not just do a standard Google search, but to actually to a, a real educated development upon it. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. They're doing Say a bunch of way. stuff on video now and oh, yeah. searching and other sources. Yeah. They're, they're really expanding well beyond the, the junk, as you said. Yeah. Uh, and there actually have been search engines for video for a while. Alta Vista has had a, a video yeah, search engine. I was engine a digital when they were doing that. For a long it, time. It was, it was marginal. Yeah. Uh, we have not talked to Google yet. Uh, Google's too busy buying up libraries. but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the, look, the, 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 uh, the, 
my, my senses, and, and I have a member of my board, I was mentioning with somebody today, who said to me, why don't you just sell it to Google? Uh, and that way you'll be able to support this kind of work in, in the future. Well, the idea of ads popping up while people are watching survivor testimonies isn't that appealing uh, to me. The te but the, the Google technology, I mean, the Google, the kind of searching that people do using Google is the kind of searching that people want to do. I mean, it's easier. That we have an, an interface, as some of you know, but it's a reasonably complicated and difficult interface to use because it depends upon our keywords. So I, I am hopeful, actually. And, and you're, you're, you're talking more in terms of Google, the public main search engine. And I'm talking more in terms of the pe people that are in their labs doing technology yeah. based on various other things that may see the light of day. And the way they do their company, all you need to do is convince one of the engineers there that that's something they want to do, yeah. and they've got, what, 20% of their time to go off and no, do something spectacular. Right. We, we, we have had a lot of conversation, actually, with a lot of technology companies about this, because we, we think, we think that when, and our archive's not entirely digitized yet, but we think that when it is, it'll be the largest publicly available database in the world. It's 200 terabytes of stuff. So from the point of view of a technology company, that's a wonderful uh, opportunity to, they may not care at all about Holocaust testimony, but the bigger the database, the, the, more, the easier it is, go, it's the more interesting it, a problem it presents. So the, uh, that's a long way of saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I have to uh, thank you for tonight's presentation. I wanted also to say that I'm, I use the show archive for my own research. A group of us uh, anthropology graduate students have uh, come together to use the archive uh, oh, for great. various research. For my own research, I've used the archive to reconstruct um, uh, the uh, rural cultural life in eastern Galicia during the interwar years in mm. Poland. So it's not only uh, about the Holocaust, but it also is a wonderful resource for uh, Jewish uh, cultural traditions um, in, in Eastern Europe. My question, I guess, is um, you mentioned 52,000 interviews. Um, are there any plans in the future to collect more testimonies uh, to add to that, uh, the archive, or has, it, has the project ended as, uh, as uh, Steven Spielberg has uh, envisioned it? Uh, well, there's a lot of things in that question. Um, first, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that, that you're using the archive. I mean, that's the reason we do the work that we do, so people will. And I should say for everyone that, that the interviews are not only about the Holocaust, as you know. The, each interview really has three pieces. One is, what was your life like before the Shoah? What happened to you during the Shoah? What was your life afterwards? There are people at USC who are using our archive to study immigration to Los Angeles in the 1950s. So there are many, many uses from the point of view of scholarship in many disciplines. First thing. Second thing is, do we have plans to do more testimony? The answer is no. Uh, take more testimony. The reason for that is that each testimony is, was expensive to do in order to do it right. Three or four thousand dollars each. That's a lot of money uh, to invest. And the original goal was fifty thousand. So uh, when we got to fifty thousand, we began to slow. Occasionally, we do additional testimonies when we have the opportunity to introduce somebody whose experience is really uh, one that, that's not in the archive. If, if another survivor of Treblinka, there are only nine survivors of Treblinka, we have six of them in the archive. If another survivor of Treblinka was prepared to be interviewed, we would interview uh, a Treblinka survivor. We have about 6,000 names in a database of people who, who wanted to be interviewed that we haven't interviewed yet. Uh, we sent all of them a package uh, so that their families could do the interviews. Um, but we have no plans to do more ourselves, in part because it's, it's a question of resources. Uh, this comes to your last, the last part of your question, which is the, actually, it's the part that usually comes up first, which is Steven Spielberg's role. Uh, uh, Steven has not, and I don't think he should have, provided all of the support for the archive over the, the years that the foundation's been in existence uh, about 40% uh, 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 of the money 
is Steven Spielberg's money. The rest we've raised. <clears throat> so we have to make decisions just like any other nonprofit organization does. And I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, the, the, the first, when I was being interviewed for the job and I met him, uh, I, said, I, I said to him, I said, you know, someday you're going to get hit by a bus. And someday everybody associated with the Shoah Foundation is going to get hit by a bus. What's going to happen to the 52,000 testimonies then? So we've been very self-conscious, actually, over the last five years about reducing his financial participation in the project and increasing other people's participation as a way of giving a larger community uh, ownership. But I want to come back to this question of additional testimonies. Uh, we won't do any more testimonies of Holocaust survivors, but we're about to begin a small a very small project with a community of Rwandan survivors in Riverside, California, and a community of Cambodian survivors in Long Beach, California. We're not going to do the interviews ourselves. I don't think that would be appropriate for us. I don't think we have the, the cultural knowledge or the linguistic skills or lots of other things that would be required. But we're working collaboratively with, with, the, with those two communities <clears throat> in the hope not collecting all there are to collect, because that's a, that's a task beyond us but collecting enough so that we can build an educational product, probably an online product, that incorporates the testimonies of survivors of these three uh, uh, genocides. Over the long run, I think that, and it comes back to, to the question about, about being inundated, uh, over the long run, I hope that one of the things that we can do, one of the things I want to do is create what I think of as a technical assistance program at the Shoah Foundation so that other groups collecting the testimony of survivors of other genocides, but not necessarily survivors of other genocides, but simply collecting more eyewitness historical testimony, uh, will be able to take advantage of what we learned the hard way, uh, which was by doing it wrong for a long time, uh, and then figuring out how to index it, how to catalog it, how to, how to make it available. Anyway, but I'm very glad to hear that, that you're using the archive. That makes me, it really makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. There's a microphone coming. <coughs> yeah, it's a great pleasure um, to attend this uh, talk because uh, I'm working on the Rwanda genocide myself, uh -huh. um, especially in relation to the genocide and memory. And uh, it seems to me that like uh, people like Primo Levi said that one of the reasons they're writing is to make sure that people remember so that it won't happen again. Yet at the same time, what he said is that it kept happening again and again and again. And not only it's happening, but it's happening when people know it. With Rwanda, it's almost like it was happening live, but people didn't care. Why? Because mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, there was an economic reason that was involved in, in the reason why people just didn't want to care. In other words, it's, um, it's as if it's not just enough for people to know that something bad is happening. But it's also like, as long as economic interests, they do not have no economic interest in stopping it, they won't stop it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm talking about like for the future, why do we want to remember? I mean, how, how in other words, I mean, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but <laughs> I mean, it's like. You're, managing, what, what, you're ma managing to make me sound optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, since like the economic reasons are so involved, what can we really do to make sure that it's not going to happen again beyond mm. just talking about it? Well, this is a, it, it, there, first of all, there's no good answer to your question. Second of all, it's a long conversation. Uh, and it's a conversation I have with myself a lot, as you can imagine. Uh, I don't really know what the answer is. I, I think, because I, there, there are two ways to think about this. One is that the Holocaust became a precedent that permitted additional genocide rather than a warning against a ge uh, additional genocide. And one could say the same of Rwanda, uh, that, that in some ways one of the reasons that the murders in Darfur are occurring is because they figured, well, the Rwandans got away with it. Maybe we can get away with it too. Uh, and despite the fact that more attention is being paid to Sudan than was being paid to Rwanda in 1994, they are getting away with it. Uh, so it's hard to have an optimistic view. Uh, I mean, sometimes it, it depends on, on how I feel when I get up in the morning. And some mornings I get up and I feel like I'm sort of climbing Mount Everest in a bathing suit uh, without oxygen. 
that, that the job that we have to do is an extremely difficult, almost impossible job. But there are other days uh, and other moments when people say to me, you know, I watched a testimony, or I saw, I saw a 16-year-old watch one of your testimonies, and I think that 16-year-old was changed by it. The genocide doesn't occur all at once. It occurs one person at a time. And that's also the way the world changes. It doesn't ch change all at once. It changes one person at a time. So when I think about the work that I do, and I think I, I know I speak for all of my colleagues at, at the Shoah Foundation, that's the way we think about it, one person at a time. Are we going to stop genocide tomorrow? No, uh, we're not. But does that mean that we shouldn't try? Also, the answer to that is, is no. Uh, and I, I acknowledge everything you say about, about the economic um, in incentives that, that keep people going. I mean, one of the saddest, most pathetic things about the Rwandan genocide is the, the deep implication of the French government uh, in what happened in, in Rwanda. But there were rescuers in Rwanda, too, as there were rescuers in, in, in the Holocaust and in every genocide. And you know, people say, what are the lessons of the Holocaust? The lessons of the Holocaust are really very simple. Uh, my predecessor, Michael Berenbaum, said this on TV about three weeks ago. Don't be a perpetrator. Don't be a victim. Don't be a bystander. And if people can get that from, from watching testimony, then one person at a time, we think we can change the world. Yeah? Uh, just a technical question. I'm curious, when you've talked about the fact that there were nine survivors of Treblinka and you gave yeah. some other single-digit yeah. figures for other camps. Belgians is uh, the other one, yeah. Was that referring to the number upon closure or liberation, or was that referring to the number of people that at, at any point in time passed through those no, camps? No. Treblinka was not liberated. Okay. Treblinka That's was right. already closed right. at the time of the end of the war. The same is true of Belgium. It's the same is true of Helmno. Uh, so that we know how many people went through, through Belgium. The Nazis kept records right. of how many and sometimes who. Uh, we know there were only two survivors, and they were both in Israel uh, right at the, at, at the end of the 40s, and they both died before they gave testimony. But you're saying that, let's just same, say Belgium is the example. Is, uh, same thing. The two people that survived Belgium, meaning that no one ever went through Belgium, ended up somewhere else, and then survived? Okay. No. Okay. Belgium was a death camp. It was the first okay. death camp. Everybody who went through Belgium, except those two people, was murdered. Uh, my they didn't die. They were murdered. My question is that to stop genocide, which would be the ultimate goal, and whether it can be done or not, yeah. really begins at a much earlier age. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is available at the uh, college level, university level. How much of this is going to be translated or put down to a level where you can educate younger people? Because that's where you have to start, mm -hmm. starting at the high, uh, older level doesn't <coughs> solve the problem. I, I agree with you completely. And I mean, I only really talked about that because I'm talking at a college. But, but in fact, more, we spend much more money and much more of our fundraising effort on uh, secondary schools and elementary schools than we do on, on higher education. And we've produced a lot of, of uh, materials. Uh, our website has a lot of stuff for teachers and for students, two exhibits, one for, for junior, uh, junior high kids and one for uh, senior high kids with teacher's guides. Uh, we've produced CD-ROMs. We have a, a German language CD-ROM uh, that's, that's being used by a million students in, in Germany. We produced, I mean, this is, this is really the core of what we do. We produced five foreign language <coughs> documentary films with directors in Argentina, the Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, Russia, and Poland. And each of those, directed by a director from that country, now has a, a, a teacher's guide and a study guide for students and is being distributed to schools in, in those countries. We're in schools in, in, in uh, we, we, we don't know exactly, but we think we're in about 12,000 schools around the world. It's not enough. Uh, it's a start, but I agree with you completely. The difficult problem, actually, is not creating materials for 15 and 16-year-olds. The difficult problem, the pedagogical problem, is for younger children. Because 
on the one hand, one doesn't want to terrify them, and the other hand, wants, one wants to tell them the truth. And we, we've tried, we have something now on our, on our website that I, we think is starting to work. It's called Children Speak, and it's the testimony of people who are children at the time of the Holocaust, who are child survivors, describing what their experience was like. And we hear from teachers that it's very effective with kids sort of sixth grade. Uh, need to find a way to work with younger children too, but it's hard. But I agree with you completely. I mean, there are two sides to this. This is a, a tension, obviously, for, for anybody who cares about history. Uh, on the one hand, historical scholarship is important. I hope I, I, I said that. On the other hand, finding a way to communicate about the past to a larger public, whether children or, or adults, is also very important. We are much more focused, actually, on K-12 schools, not only in this country but in other places, than on, on higher education, uh, on the assumption that people like you know what to do when they put their hands on a resource like this. But uh, a 15-year-old kid doesn't really know what to do with the, Holocaust, with the testimony of a survivor and needs some guidance and needs context built around that testimony if they're really going to learn something from it. Thank you. <laughs>